All right. Well, thank you for joining us today for our um, Pollinator Month. Uh, this is National Pollinator Month, and uh, we're just wrapping up Pollinator Week here. So what more perfect topic than um, things you can do in your home landscape to improve habitat and garden for pollinators. Uh, pollinators uh, probably other than the fruit gardening and, and getting to eat things from my landscape, uh, I would say, you know, the enjoyment of watching uh, bees and butterflies and, you know, all these little critters hop around from flower to flower is one of the things I enjoy most uh, about gardening and, and improving my landscape. So um, without further ado, we'll, we'll just kick off here. And, you know, of course, if we're talking about pollinators, we start with flowers. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the pollinators are there um, for a resource for themselves. Um, and the flowers, from a biological standpoint, of course, have pollen on the female parts of the flower. This is an example of a perfect flower or a complete flower, meaning the female and male flower parts are contained within the same flower structure. So, of course, the female flower parts, we would call that um, structure the pistil stigma style and ovary and then the male parts are the anther and filament and the pollen of course is on the anther and where the job of the pollinator is so important is oftentimes they help to move that pollen from the anther to the stigma and the pollen tube to allow for fertilization um, not all flowers are created equal and we'll go through you know how flowers attract different pollinators and things like that. And, and in some cases where imperfect flowers are involved, um, and a great example is, you know, if you're a vegetable gardener and you have squash, is we often see those uh, male flowers come out first, and then the female flowers generally come out a few days after those first male flowers start. Um, and why this is so important, is, uh, you know, of course, we rely on this, this food production, um, that cross-pollination. Even in cases where um, some of our flowering plants, especially our vegetables, beans, tomatoes, they're largely self-fertile, but oftentimes you will have increased fruit set um, or increased fruit size because a pollinator helped to dislodge a little bit more pollen uh, from that flower structure. And some pollinators are better at this than others. Um, some of our bumblebees uh, actually sonicate or use their wing muscles and buzz um, uh, those flowers, releasing more pollen. Uh, the honeybee doesn't pollinate in that way. So if you're a tomato grower and you want bigger tomatoes and better fruit set, uh, the more bumblebees uh, and larger bees you can have, uh, you should have increased yields from those tomato plants. But almost 90% uh, of our plants do benefit or need the help of, uh, of pollinators. And there's roughly 200,000 different species uh, of animals. And it's not just, of course, insects. We have bats and birds and, and things like that that will also act as pollinators uh, in different parts of the world. So, And this is a great example. Uh, because, you know, if we're talking about, a, a, say, a vegetable garden, is we often think that corn is wind pollinated. And this is a short video clip here. And you will see heavy bee activity on corn. So the question is, is are these bees pollinated? And the short and simple answer is no, not really. Because a corn plant has separate male flowers those tassels where the pollen is. And you can see in this finishing shot here, look at all that pollen on that uh, corn leaf. So that's a rich uh, source of protein for them. As you can see here, she's packed it away on her legs. She's gonna take it back. But if you notice, they're not moving it to the female flowers, which are those ears uh, down below. Now they may help to dislodge a little bit more pollen and more pollen may fall down uh, to those female flowers, but they're not actually moving the pollen um, to the female flower. So uh, kind of a special case, but one that I find interesting because, you know, of course we associate this with wind pollination and not uh, a true insect pollinated plant. 
but the insects do get a great deal of benefit, as you can see from that short video. So when we're talking about the characters in our gardens, obviously we have uh, butterflies, hummingbirds, the giant bumblebees, carpenter bees, some moths, wasps, um, and I think that's all I got. Almost all of these pictures throughout the presentation are mine unless they have a mark or somebody's name underneath them. Um, and so you can see just the diversity that I've been able to capture uh, within my own landscape. I really love bees though, I will say I'm probably a little biased in that um, they are just so fun to watch. Um, such excellent pollinators as a fruit tree grower, berry grower myself. Um, they are somewhat more adapted to being efficient uh, at pollinating. So, and you have incredible bee diversity uh, across North America. If we went back a couple slides, you have something like 4,000 bee species. In Georgia, we have well over 500 bee species. Uh, and this is not including the European honeybee, which isn't quite native. Of course, it's naturalized uh, and has been here, you know, at least 400 years since the Europeans came over. So um, the largest bee in North America is, of course, that carpenter bee, um, about the size of a quarter. We all know them because they drill holes in our deck and wood and <laughs> anything else that's uh, not covered in paint or uh, things like that. And we can always uh, tell them apart from other big bees like the bumblebees is they're shiny on their hiney. Um, that back end there is a little bit shinier, less covered in hair than say a bumblebee. So we know we're generally looking at a carpenter bee if we see that shiny hiney. But there are a lot of sort of bee lookalikes out in the gardens and in our landscapes. And then this is a um, tendency um, that uh, happens and it's called mimicry. So, you know, if you say can't uh, defend yourself or you don't have the ability to sting a predator, uh, one of the better things you can do is look like something that can sting you. So both of these pictures uh, are actually not bees, uh, but they do a good job of looking like a bee. How we would tell them apart, if we don't want to just grab them and try to get stung, is these are both flies because we can see they only have one set of wings. So two wings, and that's going to be a fly. A bee will have four wings. Also notice these eye structures, almost like a big helmet, go all the way across, and short stubby antenna. Um, good indications uh, that bees are flies and not bees, but you can see you can't really go on coloration or even, even that hairiness to their bodies. Generally, if they're hairy, that's a good indication they're going to be a bee, but you can see there's some flies out there that do a good job of sort of having that characteristic in mimicking um, a bee in that regard. And these guys, we see that fuzzy hair, longer antenna on the top. But this is a wasp, the one on the right. Um, most of us probably wouldn't associate that bright coloration with a, uh, a bee, but we do actually have uh, quite a number of bees that are uh, metallic and uh, quite lustrous like that. So, um, but this is the, the cuckoo wasp on the right. And I think that's, I uh, can't remember the species on this, but this guy does some great photography. He's with uh, Gwinnett College, uh, Sam there. So again, not bees. Uh, a lot of times it takes an entomologist uh, with a fine microscope to truly tell the difference um, in some of these species, but uh, one way is just to observe their behavior in the garden too. Um, wasps will generally fly much differently than bees. Uh, now they will visit flowers, but oftentimes they're not relying wholly on uh, floral resources for their uh, substance. So, you know, they're not as, as busy on flowers, pollinating and, and going from flower to flower as say a wasp would be uh, in the garden. And they sort of have those dangly legs when they fly too. This is where as a UGA uh, employee, I would insert a Georgia Tech joke, but I'm above that. I married a yellow jacket myself. So uh, all's 
fair and love and war. Um, but no, that is not a B either. These, however, uh, more great photography from um, Sam Drogue from Gwinnett College. Um, both of these are native to Georgia, native species of bees, um, and don't look much like what most of us would associate with a bee. You know, they have that bright coloration. Um, we've got a sweat bee and a small carpenter bee uh, on the left. Beautiful bees. Um, can be active throughout the season, but a lot of our uh, native bees have very brief seasons uh, within our gardens. Oftentimes, you know, they're just out for a six to eight week window in either the early spring or, you know, midsummer. And really that's about the only time uh, we'll see some of these species. So if we want to attract more of these, build a, a better habitat within our landscape and our yards, um, we have to think through the eyes of a pollinator. And so we often think of flowers, of course, but as we get further along, it's not just flowers that we're thinking about, but obviously that's where they're getting their main food from. Um, and of course, if we're building habitat, we want food, water, and shelter. So um, this beautiful sunflower here, uh, I would like to think that the sunflower has been sort of selected over time by people to grow in a way that we enjoy them, but really that plant has evolved to attract pollinators. You know, these plants can't go to, you know, nightclubs and, and meet a mate, um, and their job is to reproduce and make another generation through seed. So they have to adapt to attract pollinators. And of course, if they don't do a good job, then their genetics will not carry on. So um, the sunflower is, a, is an excellent example of what's called a compound flower. So we, you know, they sort of look like just a, a flower themselves, but each of these points where there is then a developed seed, that is an individual flower. These, what we would think are petals, are ray flowers on the outside and they're sterile. And so once the plant or the flower has um, you know, done the job of, of, of growing, um, it has to put on a show. What, what are the pollinators looking for uh, when you know, they want to go and, and visit a flower? So it has to be attractive. So you're looking at things like color. If we're talking about um, you know, bees, uh, flies, generally the colors are you know, more of those mild pastels, the whites, um, yellows, light, light purples, pinks. If we're talking about butterflies, you know, we want more of the oranges and reds. Um, but this is uh, one of the most attractive flowers I can think of in uh, the passion flower vine here. And uh, you can see it's obviously doing a very good job of attracting a broad range of pollinators with a big bee on it and a moth at the very same time. So, the second goal would be obviously to give that pollinator a reward. Um, these are nutritional, of course. So the pollinators are benefiting from visiting these flowers, doing this hard work. If you think about, um, it is life-threatening work for uh, especially say a honeybee. Uh, and oftentimes that's why um, there's different jobs and roles depending on the age of a honeybee. Um, and they really don't even start leaving the hive until they're you know, 21 days and older because that's a high risk job. Uh, they may not make it back from that um, pollen and nectar collecting flight. Uh, you've got lawnmowers, you've got windshields, you've got predators. Um, so the reward has to be there. And the reward is, you know, uh, pollen and nectar, uh, protein and carbohydrates. They get floral oils. Um, and there's probably some communication um, that goes on both at the flower and then of course back to the social insects back in the hive about where those good hangout spots were, where those rewards were located. And this is a nice video. Um, of some buckwheat planting in my garden. 
And you can see that reward um, is there and you need that to be repeated over and over and over again. If we think about um, the pollination and a cucumber, I've read that that can take up to 10 visits to the same flower to get the fully uh, pollinated fruit to develop. And oftentimes, um, one of the most common calls uh, in the summertime is people send pictures of their sort of stubby or misshapen um, squash, cucumbers. And most of the time that's due to uh, incomplete pollination. So maybe they got visited once or twice, they didn't get visited 10 times. So we need for that reward to be available and for that pollination to happen multiple times, oftentimes for a true seed to set. And if we look at a flower from a um, bee's perspective, like I said, different uh, flower colors will often attract different uh, pollinators. Um, and I try to always choose maybe more plants that I don't have enough of uh, in terms of color. You know, yellows are very common. The purple sort of lavenders are, are very common. But if I want hummingbirds and more butterflies, you know, I need to look and see and make sure I have enough oranges and, and uh, reds in my landscape. But we have to remember that bees don't really see color the way that we do. Um, this is what a bee would see um, in a dandelion flower at the top. So you can see, boy, I, I wish I could see in UV with all the weeds in my yard. Uh, dandelion flowers would be much more attractive uh, if I was just seeing them through UV light. Um, and you can see the, the cone flower, Rudbeckia below, uh, also very interesting under UV. And you can see there's almost sort of a target, right? So these are nectar guides. This allows the bees to know exactly where they need to go to both pollinate the plant, but also get the reward uh, that they're there for. So. Flower size uh, is critically important uh, if we're thinking about things like butterflies. They need a, you know, sort of a landing spot. They're not as precise of a flyer as, um, you know, some of our bees and small flower flies. Uh, so they need a, a wider flower in the aster family to sort of land on. And, uh, you know, those compound flowers like Rudbeckia, where they can land on that flower and do you know, sort of multiple visits within that flower. This is another one, uh, the sunflower with, again, multiple uh, flowers on a um, single structure. If anyone knows what this plant is, uh, this is one of my favorites in the landscape. Stop the video here in a second. So this is a intensely fragrant flower. Uh, it's a summer blooming bulb called tuberose. And it's more fragrant, like a lot of uh, very fragrant, you know, like the uh, night scented tobacco, the moonflowers. Oftentimes they only become fragrant towards the end of the day, the evenings and at night. And why would that be? Because that's when their pollinators are active. And these are pollinated by moths. Now you'll see bees in here every now and then. But if you notice the shape of the flowers on these are quite long, bell-shaped, bees do a really poor job. They try to get in there to get to that nectar, um, but they really struggle. They, they don't do an effective job. Um, but this very long tongue um, hummingbird hawk moth, which actually sounds like a hummingbird in the garden, if you've ever had one whiz by you, um, their tongue is a couple inches long. So they can get down to the bottom of that bell flower and do an excellent job of pollinating. So when we're talking about building this habitat uh, in our yards, we need to think diversity, 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 both in terms of all those flower characteristics like we already talked about, but we need to think about our bloom season. What is gonna be out there and available to pollinators? And in our area, North Georgia, we can have things in bloom at least in February through about November. Um, 
if we want to attract more butterflies, you know, it's not just about flowers, it's about the host plants for them to lay their eggs on and for their larvae to develop. So, you know, that's an important thing to consider. Um, site conditions, you know, do we have a water source? Uh, I have a couple of just shallow bird baths. Um, and oftentimes with most of our pollinators, especially butterflies, you know, kind of the muckier the water, um, the more nutrients are there, um, they're going to get more out of that than just a, a clean water source. Now, of course, if you're worried about mosquitoes, you know, you may have to uh, not quite go full on mud puddle um, if you want to, you know, manage for mosquitoes. Um, and do, are we able to sort of have an area that is just not frequently mowed, that is more just brush, uh, leaf mulch, that type of stuff. Um, the, the somewhat more unkempt areas uh, will often be some of the best uh, habitat for pollinators, especially those ones that are going to overwinter um, as uh, larvae. So, and as we're designing our landscape, maybe improving uh, our plant choices, you know, planting in clusters instead of single individual plants, uh, we'll do a much more efficient job of bringing those pollinators in. Think about, again, those whites, yellows, blues, uh, those more pastel -y type colors. If we're uh, mostly interested, again, in, in bees and those types of pollinators, reds, oranges, if we want butterflies and especially hummingbirds. Oftentimes the shallower the better because the deeper that flower, uh, as in the case of that tuberose, the more limiting uh, your pollinators are going to be. Um, of course, pesticides, um, the less we can use them, uh, the better. Um, you know, and this is of course our, mainly our insecticides. Uh, and do know that uh, even in, even organic insecticides kill bugs unless we're talking about things like, um, you know, oil sprays um, or insecticidal soaps. If we're dealing with, say, um, uh, white flies or aphids, uh, you know, usually insecticidal soaps, uh, strong blast of water will do a decent enough job uh, getting rid of some of those pests. And really, if we're able to, if we don't have a pretty strict HOA uh, that says we have to have pristine uh, zoysia grass, a lot of these turf weeds are actually excellent uh, pollinator plants. Uh, white clover from dandelions. This is a picture of henbit, henbit uh, in sort of that early spring, late winter. It's one of the earlier pollen and nectar sources out there. The bees will actually absolutely go crazy for it. So if we can have an area that maybe doesn't have to be quite perfect turf, uh, you will find that it's actually um, quite excellent uh, pollinator food sources. If we're looking at some of our butterfly host plants, um, again, these are just caterpillars in my yard. Um, top left, we have a swallowtail, one of my favorite, probably is my favorite butterfly, and I think they're caterpillar uh, is actually the, the coolest looking one. Um, fennel, dill, um, monarchs, of course, rely wholly on milkweeds as their host plants. So you need to have those milkweeds for your monarch in the bottom center. Um, and that really pretty um, uh, flower we saw earlier, um, this is the Gulf fritillary um, on the vine. So, uh, you know, as that larvae, develops, it chews up the leaves, uh, but those flowers are really just a showstopper in themselves, and you get the added benefit of it being uh, a host plant for the Gulf fritillary. I like to try to think about things um, in terms of where are my deficiencies in my landscape, where can I maybe add some uh, color variety, or especially for the season, where can I add some plants to fill in gaps in that bloom window. Uh, and oftentimes the, the biggest uh, hole in our bloom calendar is midsummer. Um, you know, beekeepers would call this the dearth. And, you know, we have that big spring flush, you know, the nectar flow, everything's in bloom. Um, but by about July and August, that's where you start to run out of a lot of um, those blooms and especially the nectar. So if you can 
trying to sort of target those areas for adding um, you know plants that would be blooming in that window you may see the even more uh, pollinators because you may have the only uh, game in town at that point uh, most of our native areas are probably not going to have much uh, until you know say goldenrod and some of the fall blooming plants would start uh, I always like to show a bunch of pictures of, of my house, hopefully to inspire others that, you know, th it can be done um, and it does take time. Um, you know, plants don't fill in overnight, but, you know, with some proper plant choices, good spacing, uh, some soil testing, hopefully you're, you're understanding what plants are going to do best in your conditions. Uh, so this is sort of what my house looked like when we got there in 2015. Outside of uh, the weeds in the turf, I don't know if I'd even call it turf, but uh, outside of the weeds in the grass, the apple trees and the magnolia tree, there was not much here for pollinators after say, you know, April or May, after everything was done blooming. Um, just a whole lot of um, fescue Bermuda mix, you know, with a little bit of clover, but, but not much else. So, you know, I sort of try to take on one new area um, every year and bring in new plants, extend that bloom season. And um, you'll see through the photos sort of how that's changed. Obviously the aerials probably don't mean a whole lot to you, um, but this is a mix of edibles and just nice blooming plants. Blueberries in the springtime here. And we'll talk about this area here. As you can see back here, I sort of have this ditch. And this is important to remember is that it's not all about flowers. We're also talking about habitat, okay? So we'll get to that here in a second. My vegetable garden down here, apple trees throughout. So lots and lots and lots of blooming plants. Um, this was, so yeah, four years later after the install, you can see stuff really filled in. I probably put some plants in here that I shouldn't have, that gotten quite big and are starting to sort of overspill onto the sidewalk there in front of the house. Back of the house was just uh, pretty gruesome looking, uh, but you could see just a year after install looked a lot better. And, you know, again, you can see the, the the pinks or purples here, the yellows, there's a Rose of Sharon, uh, there's one of the salvias here. So, you know, again, plants that also have a really long bloom window, um, you know, sometimes plants, you know, that's the one thing about say tulips is they're only in bloom for like seven to 10 days. So, you know, if we can choose some of those perennials or those shrubs that have a little bit longer of a natural bloom window, um, you know, the place is going to look nicer and the pollinators will get that much more from it. Uh, the driveway project was, was a pretty good mess here. Um, lantana for the butterflies here, and, and those have perennialized and come back most every year. Um, these liatris, which I really, really like for both bees, butterflies, and moths, um, and a mixture of other things. You know, there's some uh, native grasses which are great habitat for bumblebees. You know, they're gonna make their nest in those um, clumps of grass. Hydrangeas, of course, and some fruit trees mixed in. Bottom driveway, uh, more or less the same. And you can see just, uh, I think this install went in, in um, end, of OS, in, end of 2017. So this was just three years later. Stuff fills in pretty fast. Um, this is the only spot where I will put in annuals. So sort of that high visibility impact area. And I tend to rotate between the Portaluca and the Pansy, you know, something that's going to spread. You have lots of color um, and fill in. If you wanted an alternative uh, to an annual planting, you could also do something like this. This is ice plant, lots of blooms. I, I see tons of bumblebees on ice plant and a, and a fairly long bloom season on it. This was a year later. It doesn't look this good this year. I uh, haven't had time, but you can see again, switched over to pansies this year and just that one area where I might put in annuals. The rest is all just a mixture of perennials and woody shrubs and trees. And this is what has come out. Um, you can see monarchs, swallowtails, 
some of the flower flies, caterpillar. And this is an interesting one. Um, this is a wasp, the blue wing wasp. And if you have problems with Japanese beetles, these are a, na a natural predator to Japanese beetles. The female will lay an egg in the ground where there is a Japanese beetle, a white grub. And as that egg develops, it parasitizes the grub. So then that is one less adult Japanese beetle that will come out. So, and this is visiting uh, the flowers on time. I love the herbs for attracting pollinators because you will bring in uh, a great mixture of pollinators, not just bees. So your Gaura uh, flower here, Mexican sunflower, and uh, the lantana, of course, with the uh, nice swallowtail. There's the chrysalis of uh, our monarch, buckeyes, sulfurs. Uh, you can see the nice deep sort of red uh, flower here, that bell-shaped flower. So your butterflies are gonna go to this as well as a little bit of hummingbird activity. I don't see a ton of hummingbirds on this. This is pineapple sage. Um, nice in that it also blooms very late summer, if not what would probably be considered early fall. And just more gratuitous pollinator pictures. And these are finally the bees. Uh, and you notice I also am a hobby beekeeper. Uh, you would think with you know anywhere between 50 to 150,000 bees uh, on my small little property, it would be nothing but honeybees. But you can see every, there's enough for everybody. Uh, and in fact, there's probably not enough in my yard for the bees, uh, the honeybees that is, to, to fully subsist on. So um, they of course forage within a three mile radius. Um, but by adding these plants and this one here, I have to apologize, that is quite zoomed in, but that is a very small metallic sweat bee on your stone crop flower. Bachelor button, one of my favorite uh, flowering plants, and that we don't have a ton of flowers that are, you know, pretty much blue. There's some irises, um, but bachelor button is a really nice flower in that it, it's almost blue. That salvia, I think that thing's called hot lips on the bottom left. And then there's one of the uh, uh, improved cultivars of uh, Rudbeckia. If we're talking about pollinators um, and some of these plants, try to stick with the native cultivars, a lot of these improved cultivars. Oftentimes with these fancy colorations and improvements that they do, oftentimes what's sacrificed is the pollen or the nectar. So if you can stick with more of the native cultivars, uh, you'll probably have a much more attractive plant to the pollinators. I think this one was like cherry brandy rubecchia. And eventually it, it just sort of died out in my landscape too. Um, if we want to move on to the shelter side, um, we can build bee nests. So about 30% of our native bees, and again in Georgia we have about 530, 550 native bees to Georgia. Roughly 30% of those are going to be cavity nesters, meaning they will nest in uh, straws, pieces of bamboo, uh, pithy uh, types of, of wood like box elder or elderberry. Uh, so we can kind of put more things out there for them to have that habitat. Um, so these are some uh, straw nests that I've put up at my house and you can see the mud uh, is capped on the ends. So we can use um, straws. I really like the native bamboo. It's almost the perfect size. Um, you can buy the tubes. I've seen some people even talk about uh, pasta straws. Um, but generally we want them about six inches long, varying in size. Um, about pencil size and diameter is, is about perfect. Placement is probably the most important thing. Uh, just like a good birdhouse, you want it generally to face east to southeast. So it's going to get that early morning sun. And we want it about, you know, four to six to eight feet up off the ground. And uh, just don't put it on the north side. You will not have these things be used if they are facing the north side. 
And a couple of years ago, I, I broke open one of the bamboo um, tubes that developed at my house, and you can see what forms on the inside. Uh, really, really fascinating, these um, uh, mason bees. You know, of course, they're solitary. Uh, and by nature, a solitary bee uh, is highly non-aggressive. It cannot afford to be aggressive. They do not have that ability to communicate with other bees and, you know, say we need to swarm or we need to attack. Um, so they are very non-aggressive uh, because they can't afford to be aggressive. It is, you know, they, they're, they are all their own worker. They are all their own queen. So there's no division of labor. And of course, if they go get in a fight, then, you know, their, their genetics are not going to pass on. So, um, but what you see in here is uh, about a day's worth of work. It takes her about a day to build this uh, mud wall, gather enough pollen, pack it in here to lay her egg. So that larvae that then starts to develop has enough resources to make it to adulthood. She can choose to fertilize them, which will develop into a female. Uh, or lay an unfertilized egg, which will be a male. And if we go back, the last couple uh, cells that are laid in here, eggs, those will be the males. So they will emerge first in the spring. And this is really just about survival in that one, if there's predators that come in here, they're gonna get the males because obviously you don't need as many males to continue on. Um, or if we get sort of a fall spring, a blackberry winter, sometimes they're called, and it warms up and they get that environmental cue to start coming out. The males will, of course, come out first a few days early, be ready for the females. But then if it gets too cold, uh, the females are still packed in warm in their, in their mud cells. So um, I did have some of these uh, straw tubes used by something much different uh, than a bee. And we can see what, what it looked like here. So you have these grass caps at both ends. And inside it looked like total carnage. You had just wings and body parts left over and then a pupae inside. So I had to of course do some investigating. Uh, and I think I called one of our entomologists to, to get their input on what we might've seen inside this uh, paper tube. And what we ended up getting was this uh, grass carrying wasp. Um, it can maybe look a little scary because it is a wasp, uh, but again, it's a solitary wasp, not a yellow jacket, not social, so not able to call up friends and, and chase you out of the yard. Uh, but they are a predator of crickets and katydids um, in our landscape. And what those uh, wings were that we saw there, um, and, and you can see she's, she's uh, stinging a, a grasshopper or a katydid that is about the same size as her. Then she's somehow able to fly with that, uh, you know, paralyzed uh, grasshopper, carry it back to this straw, pack it in here, then lay an egg on it. And then as that larvae develops, it uh, of course eats the dead or paralyzed uh, prey. So quite fascinating. Uh, and definitely beneficial in our landscape. Or we can, if we don't have straws, uh, we can also just take pieces of wood, drill holes in them. Um, the one thing about this nest as an example, those holes are probably way too close together. Um, you know, these, these bees can share um, pests and parasites. Uh, if we want to talk about bee decline over the years, one of the probably biggest um, reasons for that has been uh, the varroa mite. Um, there's not as much research to know if the varroa mite also bothers um, uh, native bees, but it would make sense if they're jumping around sharing flowers with honeybees and the honeybees um, have those varroa mites, then I guess there's probably a potential for uh, at least that pest to jump over to native bees. So you wouldn't want to put holes quite as close together as what these are. Um, again, facing south, or east or southeast, um, and well enough off the ground. Um, and you can really get creative. You can really flash out your yard with some of these drilled um, native bee nests. Um, this picture here is, of course, off the internet. 
This was a former county agent uh, that was here in Georgia. He and his wife built the one on the right. But I, I mean, I think they're a nice conversation piece, a nice addition to the landscape just from an aesthetic standpoint, and not to mention the habitat benefit you're gonna get. I have seen some where they will actually put chicken wire uh, sort of on the outside. You know, of course, this one kind of cracks me up in that you're attracting birds, but then you're also maybe feeding the birds with uh, your insects right here. So, um, you know, sometimes it, it may be that you want to put uh, chicken wire or something to at least keep those birds from having as easy of a meal uh, in your native bee hotel there. But 70% of those 500 plus native bees uh, actually just nest in the ground. Um, and I get that call every spring. Uh, what do we do with these bees? They're you know, tearing up our yard. Again, these bees are not social. Um, they are not going to swarm and you know, uh, run your kids out of the yard. And generally, I hope that people will just leave them alone and know that they will be gone uh, in a few short weeks. Uh, again, these are the ground nesting bees, not yellow jackets, which also nest in the ground, but they are remarkably different. And you can usually tell the difference between a yellow jacket hole and a native bee nest hole. Um, these are going to favor areas that uh, have well-drained soil. So oftentimes it'll be on a slope um, facing east, uh, usually, um, or south and has just kind of poor ground cover, poor turf, if you will. So um, here's an excellent example at my house. Um, this is a ground nesting native bee aggregation that is probably, I would say 50 feet long by about 15 feet wide. Um, and you can tell very easily that these are not fire ants, uh, that they're not yellow jackets because you have multiple smaller mounds with a single hole that's about uh, the same width and diameter of a pencil. Um, this is habitat, you know, there are no real flowering plants. So again, it's not just about flowers in every square inch of our landscape. This is excellent habitat. Um, and this area has just sort of grown from, from year to year that I've been at this place. So, um, and actually, uh, by accident, when I put in my first blueberries, I planted them right here. Uh, I didn't know that I had this aggregation uh, so close, uh, but these guys are generally coming out March 20, you know, end of March, um, 1st of April, and that's exactly when blueberries are in bloom. So who knew I was, you know, so well planned uh, when I put things in. This is what you're going to see if you were to do a cross section of some of those uh, ground nests. Um, so again, they, they are not social, they, they're not fully studied, they, there may be some division of labor um, in that sort of uh, aggregation, but there's not enough that's really known about the, the ground nesting bees, so, um, but they are unaggressive, uh, they're actually aerating your ground, so they're probably doing you a service, hopefully they're not helping the uh, soil too much to where you grow thicker turf and make the area less hospitable to their uh, nesting habitat. But um, bumblebees are a little different in that um, they will generally use old rodent holes. Um, you will have one overwintered queen and immediately she will start sort of making her colony. So there's, they're more kind of eusocial uh, or semi-social, I guess you would say. Um, and they do actually make honey. Um, I've got a picture of some honey pots. We had a run in with a nest of bumblebees. So in general, they are uh, unaggressive unless they are defending that colony. And what happened at our house is um, they actually made a nest inside our carport above uh, some stuff that we had stacked up. Uh, I think I had some some burlap, and they had made a nest in the middle of this burlap inside a carport, um, and we didn't know they were there, and I think uh, my wife heard some noise, and so she removed some things, and boy, immediately they just went into defense mode, and that was, that was not a fun experience for any of us, uh, because a lot of them got stomped out. So, but in general, um, tufts or clumps of native grasses, old rodent 
you know, wood piles, tree stumps, that type of thing is where they're going to want to be. Um, and this is sort of that nest that came out. Um, again, it was just rolled up in some burlap about seven feet off the ground. So um, not typical of a bumblebee uh, colony or nest. And these were some of the honey pots that they were trying to defend and uh, tasted just like honey. I uh, stuck my finger in some of these pots and in, uh, tasted just like honey to me, just as good as honey. Um, if we're Looking at ways, and maybe we're on a um, you know tight budget or something like that. Um, there are ways to um, get plants more affordably. Uh, of course, most cities will have Arbor Day events. These will generally have flowering trees. Uh, I know the one in Canton has, has done catalpa trees and red buds and dogwoods. So look for those type opportunities. Um, learn to become a better gardener. A lot of your plants need to be divided every few years. Well, then you can, of course, then just expand your um, plants. If you have gardening friends, you can trade some of those divisions uh, with maybe plant material that you're looking for. Um, I put this in there, but with caution. These end of season sales or the, you know, um, orphaned plant rack, just because they're on sale doesn't mean they're a good deal. Um, you need to inspect them for pests. The last thing you want to do is bring in something that you know was declining because, say, it had aphids or heaven forbid scale or something like that, and then all of a sudden you have spread that in your landscape. So um, those end of season sales or the rehab plant rack, uh, that's a buyer beware situation. I would um, proceed with caution there. A lot of our bird seed, uh, you know, at least sunflowers, <laughs> that's where most of my sunflowers come from now is just from my bird seed. So um, if we can look at feed stores too, especially for our vegetables, it's oftentimes cheaper to buy, um, you know, seed by the, by the scoop or something like that. Um, and if you learn how to start your own seeds, um, you know, it's, it's way cheaper to buy you know, a pack of seeds and get 50 plants, then one plant for, you know, four or five bucks or something like that. So again, it's, it's all about how much you're able to do, uh, where your skill level is, but there are ways to, of course, then just get more plants. And then of course, our Master Gardener plant sale, which is down at the Senior Center, both today and tomorrow. Uh, great plants for what I view as great prices. Um, but, do do a soil test. Know what your soil has and what it may need based on what you are attempting to grow. Your pH may uh, be in a non-ideal range. Some of your starting nutrients may be deficient. So uh, have a good understanding. A soil test is only $10. Uh, you're going to spend far more than that in both time, labor, and everything else. Um, and, and if you're new to your house, have an understanding of you know, maybe a season long, what your landscape does. Um, and oftentimes it takes for you to be there for a really big rain event or a really rainy month to know truly what your landscape uh, is all about. Um, but that is critically important or where those areas that just don't drain um, what your sun exposure looks like in March, July, uh, September, because those sun patterns will change, obviously. Um, and mulch, 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 man, um, that's one of the best ways to both improve our soil structure, obviously to create a, a less weedy uh, area around the, our plants, and then, you know, uh, conserve water and so on. Um, best practices for our plants is to, of course, limit or eliminate uh, overhead watering. You know, plants don't want water on their leaves and their foliage. They want water in their roots. So um, watering at the right time, if we absolutely have to have those pop-ups or hand watering with uh, you know, the hose, uh, watering early in the day so those plants can dry out so we have less issues with disease. Uh, oftentimes I get the question, you know, maybe we have the back 40 that we're tired of mowing, what can we do? Uh, it's never as easy as what you may think. You just sort of let it go and wildflowers are going to 
uh, come up um, because oftentimes we're going to be battling uh, invasives, uh, old aggressive grasses, and so on. Um, but there are some plants that can do well with a little bit of soil prep and with some management. Um, so we would call these, say, a bee buffer, or maybe a meadow. Um, my experience with most of these, I put some notes, Jerusalem artichokes, only put those in an area if you want to have Jerusalem artichokes there forever. You will never get rid of them um, once you put them in. So tread with caution there. Uh, your cone flowers will eventually probably run into um, a disease, asterisk yellow phytoplasm. So you may get a few good years with cone flowers, but eventually they're probably going to succumb to that disease. Uh, hairy vetch, it's a great pollinator plant. It can be a pretty nasty weed. Um, so, you know, just understand just because maybe something's a great pollen source or a nectar source may not be something you want to have uh, in your landscape. Uh, blanket flower, yarrow, all those ones down at the bottom, excellent. Uh, annuals for the most part, yarrow will uh, perennialize, um, but more or less, um, you know, behave well in the landscape and will do great first year uh, annual seeding and come up pretty well for you. And some examples of, uh, you know, again, things you can buy at the feed store, uh, crimson, uh, white clover, buckwheat, usually you're going to buy this by the pound. And especially with buckwheat, within four weeks, this is what you will have. You will have a wonderful uh, floral display. Now, the beekeepers may complain that, you know, it's, it's not great honey, you know, but if you're plant, planning on having this in bloom when nothing else is in bloom in July or August, hey, it's better than nothing, right? Um, this is a good example of, of the growth in a little buffer that I put on the edge of my garden, literally a month later, it went from seed in the ground and a little bit of water to about three foot tall, uh, just sheer blooms. Um, so if you want that video earlier of the bumblebee jumping around from flower to flower, that was on this little patch of buckwheat here. I like to end this with some of my personal favorites um, as far as pollinator plants, if you will. Um, and these are old slide sets from a presentation I did where it was more of a guessing game. So this is apples. Um, apples are in the rosaceae family. So you actually have a, a fairly nice sort of rose fragrance if you've ever been under an apple tree. Uh, to me, it smells like heaven, uh, but a fairly nice longer uh, bloom season, you know, about maybe two weeks. Um, and the bees will actually absolutely go crazy for them. Same with your blackberry um, bushes. Uh, so again, you know, I like to eat. Uh, I like to grow stuff that also I get some benefit out of, uh, but also know that, you know, these are gonna do an excellent job of attracting pollinators. The tree I love to hate, uh, the one shade tree, if you remember that aerial picture of our landscape, uh, this 40 plus year old uh, Southern Magnolia, um, Great shade, but man, it is a constant mess. Um, magnolias are interesting in that they actually evolved before bees. And so bees will go to them, um, but they uh, evolved with beetles as their primary pollinator. So mo most magnolias are about 100 million years old uh, before uh, bees came on to, uh, onto the scene. So bees will go to them, but for as big as these blooms are, uh, as many bees as I have, you don't see a ton of bees uh, in and out of these flowers. This is an interesting plant. The ATF hasn't busted me yet. You look at those leaves and you would think uh, it kind of looks like uh, something that uh, is a more controlled substance, uh, has that palmate uh, compound leaf. Um, but this is Vitex or Chase tree. Uh, you're seeing this used more and more uh, because it is an easy to grow uh, small tree, large shrub, um, has a nice long bloom season. You're going to get butterflies on this. Of course, the bumblebees. I've started to see the honeybees on it more and more, um, but especially the, the bumblebees and the butterflies will absolutely love this plant. Similar to this is probably your butterfly bush if you really want to bring in butterflies. Um, these are more or less uh, the same in terms of landscape look, if you're looking at things that way, kind of have that 
lavender um, uh, bloom color. Uh, one of your sedums. Um, this is a nice plan and one obviously little to no maintenance once it's in the ground. Um, it's a succulent, so basically no water demands. And the bloom season is um, end of summer. Um, so again, there's not as much in bloom around that time. So it will be a very popular plant um, when it's in bloom. Easy to grow, easy to share with others. Nice plant. Uh, native plant here, Stokes Aster. Uh, it's in bloom right now. And again, this is a pretty wide, easily accessible flower. So you're gonna get bees just stuck in the middle there, getting pollen all over themselves, as well as butterflies and moths. Uh, so a nice native plant. Of course, I mentioned uh, the Echinaceae or cone flowers. Uh, these are compound flowers and that each of these locations here is an individual flower. Um, again, nice wide flower, big disc for butterflies to land on. Of course, bees will enjoy it as well. This is one that one of our master gardeners has at his house, and I, I think this plant is great. Uh, I actually got one recently, but this is St. John's wort. Um, and there's a couple of different forms. This is more of a small bush. Um, works great in, you know, sort of uh, rock gardens or something like that. It is mostly evergreen, uh, which is nice. And then you have more of a uh, prostrate or um, uh, ground cover form, which if we're thinking about ways to sort of renovate an old landscape, you see so much sort of evergreen ground cover that is juniper, which, you know, it might cover the ground and look green year round, but, you know, the one thing it's lacking is uh, a flower. And this is a pollinator's dream. They will go crazy for the blooms on this, has a nice uh, longer bloom season. Now it's not as full of a cover of blooms uh, like the shrub form, but you'll see it, you know, sort of sporadic throughout the planting. Easy to grow, uh, works well in full sun and mixed shade. Uh, your butterfly weed, uh, one of the milkweeds, obviously this is the host plant for all those nice uh, monarchs at the house. Uh, so you've got to have some milkweeds. This is a relatively easy one to grow. They don't transplant well, so you probably need to start your own seed. Bachelor button, we already talked about that one. And just more gratuitous um, bee images here. I love this one, mid-flight, crimson clover going from flower to flower, looking head on at the camera. And here another one is uh, enjoying the, the nectar drink here. So, uh, but I just love that one, head on. Coming at the camera, trying to get me. So I already saw enough sunflower pictures. This is uh, your thyme. So again, if we're looking for something for low growing ground cover, somewhat evergreen, uh, works great, you know, maybe in a rock garden or something like that. Man, thyme is one of the best plants in my opinion. And, you know, you can always go out and get some for uh, any cooking you're doing. Uh, button bush, the native uh, shrub. You'll find this all around Lake Gallatin and the butterflies go crazy for it. About the only thing I would say is maybe a downside on it is uh, it will get fall webworms. So, you know, something to consider, but you know, the, again, it's, it's all about the habitat. So if it's, you know, good for the butterflies, you're probably also gonna get moths. Um, so you can always cut those out if they start making their web um, on one of the branches. That's generally what I do with my, um, with my bush. Blueberries, of course, everybody knows about blueberries. You can see that long tubular flower that sort of hangs down. Uh, uh, honeybees are not the best at pollinating this. Their tongue is not long enough. So these bigger native bees, uh, their tongue is long enough to where they can do a little bit more efficient of a job pollinating. Them. Some of our sweat bees on Rudbeckia, um, just the most cheerful plant. Um, out there, really enjoy them. They can get that asters yellow um, phytoplasm, so they may not necessarily perennialize long term, but
but you should be able to get at least a few good years out of them. Um, guessing game here was the answer is lavender. Um, lavender will drive pollinators crazy. You can see this short video here. Uh, the activity on just one plant um, is, is almost too much to take in at once. Um, if you tried to count them all on this one bush, you would probably just have to start over a number of times. So um, not the easiest plant to grow. So you need to make sure you're doing a lot with your soil. Um, they do like a more um, you know, Mediterranean type of climate, which we obviously don't have. Uh, they're not going to tolerate wet soils, so um, you know they might work better in a container. This was actually in a raised bed, um, and they like a more alkaline soil. So um, only way to know if you have the right pH is start with soil test, and you may need uh, a good amount of lime to get them uh, happy. Liatris, I had some pictures of these earlier. Very, very easy to grow. Uh, you can buy them in um, bulbs in the sort of late winter, they will sell the bulbs for the, you know, the summer bulbs and rhizomes, so your irises and canna lilies and those bags. Uh, and that's how I started with these. I think I got a bag of 50 corms and they have done well to just sort of perennialize and then also start to spread from seed. Mexican sunflower, look at that beautiful monarch down there and a bumblebee. You know, so again, it's all about kind of having plants that will attract all of them. Um, the only maybe challenge with this plant is it can sort of lodge in the wind and get broken. So you may want to have it in an area where maybe it just doesn't get um, quite as exposed to uh, winds or wind damage or have a way to sort of support it or have a stake in the middle or something like that. That's about the only thing I've really noticed with it is it, it can break um, in the way that it grows. Cosmos. Uh, this is not the best picture, but it is in that you can see this was an area of the field where I just quit mowing. And, you know, so obviously there's grasses that are going to take over and cosmos, if allowed to, can kind of keep up with, you know, more or less just being seeded on top of grass. Um, probably not the prettiest to look at, but really if we're thinking about wildflowers and meadows, they're not really that, um, you know, postcard of just a, a field of blooms. It's probably going to look a little bit more unkept like this. Uh, calendula is a nice plant, easy to grow from seed. And that's probably the only way you're going to be able to grow it is from seed. And I would put it in the category of being semi-frost hardy. These images here, and I love this one, in that you have a beetle in here and two honeybees trying to get this flower. And the reason that is, is because this was well into November already passed at least two or three frosty nights. So everything else was more or less done. This was one of the few flowers that was still out, still making pollen and nectar available. And you can see it was a popular plant uh, that time of year. There are tons of resources online. Uh, there's the UGA honeybee program. UGA extension site has lots and lots of stuff we've been working on for the last couple of years. The trees for bees program. Um, USTA NRCS has things. Xerce Society is a, an incredible uh, nonprofit that focuses on uh, invertebrates and uh, insects. And Pollinator Partnership. And that guy's uh, pictures here, Sam from Gwinnett College. Uh, if you want to get more of his microscope images, um, that's the link to his stuff. I really have enjoyed both of these books. Joe Wilson's uh, Bees in Your Backyard. It reads a little bit like a textbook. Um, and he is from out west. And most of our bee diversity in the US is out west, actually in the desert. Um, so a lot of it is more, you know, kind of that um, mountain region in the southwest. Um, but he does a great job in this book, uh, great photos. Um, it's a, it's pretty science heavy. Um, I think it was maybe in the $20 range. And then the other book here is just a quick <laughs> sort of uh, coffee table type of book. Uh, one set of pages, you know, left side, right side is one plant. And it tells you the pollinators that are attracted to it. If you're a beekeeper, it will even tell you sometimes 
the quality of the honey from that plant. So I really enjoy that, that book there. Um, and it's just quick, easy, you, you know, it's not that you're digesting chapters at a time. Um, and it tells you what region of the country those plants are gonna do best in. And most of the plants in that book are actually more East Coast type plants. Uh, coming up very quickly is the third annual Great Georgia Pollinator Census. Uh, so I would encourage you to look into that, hopefully participate. Very simple, uh, download uh, the tally sheet, spend 15 minutes on a blooming plant, and just count the number of visits on that one plant. Um, I find it to be just a very mindful experience to sit still in the garden, and watch the activity for that long on just one plant. Um, it really kind of changes your perspective. You can see how much I have going on. Very rarely do I ever just sit in one place. So it's as much for me about just that experience as it is counting insects, but the, the data is important. Uh, Georgia was the first state to start this program um, and this is our third year of doing it. So um, please do uh, look into participating. And uh, if you have children, uh, if you're a teacher, there's resources for uh, getting kids involved as well. So thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, um, comments about how to improve your habitat, your landscape, uh, I'm always here available through email and at the office. So thank you very much.